Bishop asked me to talk a little bit about my life journey. I won't be very long. And, um, I was born in Uganda on the 10th of June, 1949, 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Nobody was born at that time of hour. Uh, I wasn't expected to live, so uh, they woke up uh, the then bishop of uh, Uganda to come and baptize me. He came and he baptized me, uh, thinking that by the morning I would be dead, but at least I've been baptized. Now, if you still doubt in the efficacy of infant baptism, I <laughs> prove that it does work. <laughs> um, I was in, I was full term, but I was only four months in waiting. It took quite a uh, number of five years for me to lose my energy and my sheer care. I'm, I'm the sixth of 13 children, and um, so I come from quite a very big family. And the love and care that my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and my uncles, my aunties, and it was, uh, was quite uh, remarkable. And so growing up in that little place, uh, my father was then the headmaster of the primary school, and our primary school was a mile away, so you had to walk a mile to school and a mile back. Uh, and then when I finished the primary school, going to what they then called the secondary school, which was two years, um, that one was a good nine miles away. Uh, and then when we went to the secondary school, the senior secondary school, that was a good 12 miles away. I was very fortunate that there was a missionary who had sympathy on me, with me, on me and uh, gave me a bicycle. Um, and so I was the great owner of a rally bicycle. And I can honestly tell you, although this was, goes back to, really to 1958, that bicycle is still going. <laughs> Not a lot you say about good modern manufacture. <laughs> Most bicycles really don't last for more than four, five, six hundred years. Um, so those were in the days when things were built to last. Well, I went to school, went to university, and it's, I wanted to become a doctor, but um, the university was just going through what we could do for more engineers, and of course my subjects were strongest in maths and, and um, physics and chemistry. They wanted me to uh, become an engineer. So I did a course for one year, and I thought, no way, no way am I going to be an engineer. <laughs> so I asked the university, but the medicine bit was already full, so the only new, 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 new faculty which was starting was law, so I changed from reading engineering and reading law and did read law, practice, um, and of course one into trouble with it, Idi Amin at the time of his greatest brutality. The, the thing for me which I want people to remember and which describes me, not only that I was baptized on the night where everybody else thought I was going to die, but also when I was 10 years old when Jesus Christ became so real to me. Um, you know there's that wonderful verse <coughs> In John's Gospel, um, you know, one of the verse, uh, you know, it begins by saying he came to his own, his own received him not, uh, but those who received him, that's John 1 12, he gave him the power, and the, in other words, he gave him the power to become the children of God. Um, it isn't that he simply accepted them, and we can almost sometimes make the Gospel look a little bit weak, uh, a little bit not as strong as it is actually. Um, you know, you were granted the very life of God and you became a child of God through this faith in Jesus. Um, and it was so real to me that in my primary school, um, I went and started telling everybody the mo that morning about how Jesus is important, why we need to put our faith in him because we become his friends and he gives us our past sins, gives us new life in the present and then hope for the future. And I wanted every, everybody in my school, really, uh, to get to know Jesus. It, it was an old boys school, and um, uh, Church, of, Church of England school, and, um, and in those days there were really two denominations in, in Uganda, a Roman Catholic or Church of England, and, and of course if you wanted to insult, and I'm going back some 53 years ago, if you wanted to insult an Anglican, you called them Roman Catholics. And if you wanted to insult a Roman Catholic, you called them Anglicans. 
Yeah, the, the two were never to meet at all, and how things have changed. And I remember in the school, these boys who wanted to shut me up, every time I came to tell them about Jesus, they kept saying, oh, here comes the Pope, here comes the Pope. <laughs> well, they're in the process of electing one who knows. <laughs> and I've been waiting ever since uh, those many years ago. But you see, this business of Jesus and what he actually does to people, is remarkable, and, and as I really finish my little remarks, I just want to read you some wonderful verses. Uh, verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, he begins by saying, actually, you and I, all of us, were dead through trespasses and sins, uh, which we once lived in, following the course of this world, following this ruler of the part of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient, all of us once lived among them, in the passion of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. In other words, you couldn't distinguish us from anyone else, the, the Apostle Paul writes. And then he says, but God, and God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive. Together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his great kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand to be our own life. Now, did you hear in those words, the coming and the death and resurrection of Jesus was not only that our sins may be in the past given and given new life in the, in, in the present and hope for the future, but he said he raised us with Jesus and made us to sit with him in the highest places. Now, sometimes when we are on earth, we behave as if heaven is something in the future. It's actually, you're living there now. That is if you know Jesus. He raised us with him and made us to sit with him in the highest places. So that in the age to come, he may show how kind he was. Now, I don't know some of you, but um, we launched in the Church of England this little book called Love, Life, and Lent. Um, and every day there is a little action. Now, I read to you what today's um, reading was, about, which, which I think um, it says, Have more fun. And it begins by quoting a bit of scripture, Psalm 16, verse 11. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In a comment. There is a widespread belief that the Christian faith is so serious and so important that there can be no room for fun. Some people think it's so serious. In fact, record has it that in the Church of England, uh, nobody ever cracked a joke in a sermon. <laughs> the first person to do it was William Temple. And we were absolutely shocked that an archbishop was in a pulpit cracking a joke. Why? Because they believe that Christian faith is so serious and so important, there can be no room for fun. And then, Paul Abuda comments, in fact, Christian life and faith is so very important that the only thing to do is to enjoy it. To enjoy it with all the fullness of joy that is to be found in Christ's presence. If we seek to express this joy in our lives, when we do that, must surely involve having fun. So, have more fun. Do something today just for fun. Now, friends, this is where the faith for me comes alive. Uh, there is a, a bishop who did. Um, he was a bishop, I continued until he was 83. And um, they used to call him, I won't give his name away, they used to call him X Our Joy. X Our Joy. Why? 
because on Easter Sunday morning, he would come into the liturgy right at the back uh, and say, Today is a day of great joy. <laughs> Christ is risen. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, the kind religion is not true in the future. So, have fun. So, I hope you're having a lot of fun in your uh, Christian life and Christian faith. In fact, my motto is very simple. If you want to grow, grow a church in it, there are only two things, it seems to me, Jesus did. Prayer and parties. You see the number of times he prayed and the number of times he was having parties. And some people were very angry eh? that he was so busy having parties. They're the ones who are miserable, not Jesus. I think I've said it now. <laughs> We have become browbeaten by what the media said. Uh, I was quite struck with the night. You know Rob Pro? You know the man I'm talking about? RMD, you know, all the time. But last night I was quite surprised on question time that he spoke more sense than apart from a lot of people actually. It was about the Roman Catholic Church and Cardinal O'Brien. So all the Roman Catholic Church is in trouble, is in trouble. Oh, he did it. Is it popular? And they went on. And Rob Crow said, wait a minute. Jimmy Sullivan worked with the BBC. Nobody says everybody in the BBC is a pedophile. Why, when it comes to church, what kind of branding is true of every Roman Catholic? There's a wonderful vision in Ezekiel, chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. Ezekiel, as a prophet, looks at the nation of Israel, and all he sees, they're just like death. Uh, and he's given a vision of a, a valley full of dry bones. In other words, the people look as though they're set in death. And there's a question to come to the prophet, son of man, can these bones And he's very wise. He says, not like a lot of us today in the church, can these bones live? We say, oh yes, they will. But we do, we will reorganize. Um, we'll do as far as That's not what he does. He says, Sovereign Lord, you know all things. So the Sovereign Lord says, prophesy. Speak to the winds to come from the east and west. And the wind, which is really represents the spirit, wisdom, great stuff. And in that vision, he sees these birds coming together. And then further on, he says, speak again to the spirits and let flesh come. And then he does. And then in the vision, again, he says, speak to the wind and let there be breath. And in that vision, he sees actually what was death coming to life. I want to suggest that the Church of England may look like that valley of the dry bones, and the only way to reawaken it to life is not more reorganization, is not more committee meetings, is a prayer by the faithful that the Spirit of God will breathe on this rather tired church. Because it's only by the Spirit of God that life can actually come. And as I go around the glasses, I go around the province, I'm actually seeing signs of real life. So to those young men, I want to invite them to come to one of my meetings and experience what God is doing. Because the only way, the only way they know the thing is living, what Jesus said, come and see. Don't spectate from a distance, come and see. So, so I'll say to them, come, test and see, you're going to be surprised. Uh, that all the images you've got, and it's interesting that the uh, 
living with the media, which constantly is telling us we are terrible, we are awful, we are bad, we are this. But I'll tell you something exciting. At the beginning of the Antron Ashram is there, I visited Middlesbrough and went there for back. And a hundred churches in the Diocese of York are sending food to people who would really be starving. And they've distributed a lot of food for a lot of people. And the local council is amazed by how the church has actually been feeding the hungry. You want a miracle today? There's one of them. So come and see what's happening to our ministries, we have people, our ministries, those who are poor, who are lonely, who are in a great difficulty, but also come to some of our services and you'll be surprised. Um, yes, we may be singing hymns, ancient and commotion, But um, it's quite possible that there is life. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, Tim Vine called them hymns, ancients, and our lives. <laughs> and you may think that's all there is, but actually the church is still living, and I found a lot of life in a lot of places that I've gone. And we must not have a negative view about all our sorrows, that is all bad, is all terrible. Yeah, there are things we need to change, but. In the end, I, um, on Saturday, tomorrow, I've got this step forward. Quite a number of young people wanting to find out about vocation, the kind of mission for palace. I'm going to use my awards in another school next week. So, uh, yeah, my view is not a good school. My view actually is a slightly, but we've got to engage, but we won't go there. So, tell them to come and see. which was um, looking at the future of an industry which is very, very much rooted in the past. And one of the themes which was being um, discussed was the need for a long-term vision to be able to enable an organization, an industry, the railway industry, which is steeped in the past, to be able to move into the future. And so a vision for the year 2050 of the railways in this country was presented. Now I think that to follow on from that previous question, could we have your vision for the church in 2050? My vision is that those people who know and love Jesus ought to be so filled with his love and his grace, they will be like the early church which turned around a pagan society to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They didn't wait for 20 years, 50, 30 years. You remember that when the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, explaining that the Jesus whom you crucified, God has declared him both Lord and Saviour, and that very day 3,000 people were converted and baptized. And in the end of chapter 2 it says, And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those whom he was calling. I want a more fresher calling of the Spirit of God to do what happened in the early church, and by the way, to do what the Linus aided, Cuthbert's did in this part of England. They evangelized the place and people who really didn't know God at all got to know him. So the plan of God, first of all, is that every baptized Christian who loves Jesus, they have got to do what I see in other parts of the world. You know, we've got a lot of weather here, don't we? And we talk a lot about weather because we've got a lot of it. If you came to Uganda, we would not be talking about weather because we haven't got weather. We have got climate. We know it's going to be dry, and so you never talk about it. If every Christian in this place full of weather was able to talk about Jesus, the way they talk about weather, we may get a chance of getting the message across, and it won't need 50 years. The only trouble is that we've got Christians who are so silent 
and so quiet, they are not known as disciples of Jesus. And we've now gone into a bit of our habits of looking for consumers of religion and non disciples of Jesus. People walk around churches which suits their sort of spiritual diets. So we've got these consumers of religion. I'll take what I like. Uh, Lo and behold, a vicar who, when they're new, forgets who is responsible for arranging the flowers. <laughs> and they invite me, says, extra arrange the flower. Boy, what breaks out? <laughs> oh, who's supposed to be the water for tea and coffee? <laughs> or sitting in a pew where you've been fit sitting for years. As if it's going to be numbered pews in heaven. <laughs> and uh, so the church needs that to be shaking up today, not done in 50 years' time. So my vision is that the Spirit of God poured out for every Christian going out, telling their friends about the love of God. And I can tell you that vision worked with Jesus, worked with the disciples, worked with the other church, worked with Paulinus, Aiden, and Covenant. And if you read the book of David, he said, it was this constant witness the love of Jesus. Believe it, this is not me. David says, this is what converted the barbaric English and turned them into nation. Your nation is built on conversion. It's not built on ideals or goals or places. It's Jesus who built this nation. So people need to wake up to the possibility that's possible. I mean, Paulinus will come into a community and will preach. You know, there's a place where he one day walked by the river and ended up baptizing 3,000 people. Now you say, this is important. It wasn't it. It didn't live for centuries. It didn't. Their plan was a person. You will be my witnesses when the Spirit comes upon you, beginning in Jerusalem, the ends of the earth. Because any other man made vision, I'm afraid, lasts for a decade and that's the end of it. And incidentally, that's true of industry. Uh, look at the whole manufacturing base. Uh, in a global market, you get somebody coming in, buying it off, telling you it's going to be very good. And before you know where you are, they've taken their profit and they've gone. That's what happened at um, a red card, didn't it? The tax apartment, the people that are still, the same with farming. Man made plans have got a very short lifespan. God made plans have a chance of lasting eternity. I'd rather follow Jesus and his method because it's long lasting. So that's my plan, sir. And I hope you're going to join me in challenging one another to be so filled with the Spirit of God that we go out and make disciples. If everybody decided to talk to their neighbor about Jesus, persuaded them that it was worth coming and listening to the worship in church, they may not come immediately, but my experience is as, a, as a, an ordinary Christian, as a vicar, um, was that we were able to break through by teaching every Christian they were supposed to be disciples of Jesus and the greatest witness is among the laity. Your vicar can't do it, actually. She's only one, you've got a majority of laity. And there are more of them than her, so mathematically, the rest of you are the greatest witnesses of the gospel of Jesus. Okay, sir? That's the vision. The church as an establishment is steeped in traditions with elaborate ceremonies, bureaucracy, hierarchy, and systems with names like canon law and visitations. Is it time in this 21st century to consider some radical simplification of the established church? I mean, I hate systems. I only use them because they can help me to get I mean, I'm on Twitter simply because I can get hold of my now nearly 40,000 followers. And, but I don't use it as a way ever believing that's the only way of talking about God and Jesus. I still believe in person to person encounter, it's far, far more serious. So, visitation and all other things are meant to be a health check. Just like we, we go and see a doctor when. We're not feeling well, but we wouldn't want the doctor to be visiting us every day we live. Um, so my view is we need to get back to the simple message of God in Jesus that he 
soul and the world, he sends his own son. And those who believe in him should have life. And that Christ said, when the Spirit has come upon you, you will be my witnesses to the end of the time. And at the end of Matthew's Gospel, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go you therefore and make disciples. So that test of any system, does it lead to new disciples following Jesus or not? Because if it doesn't, well, why are you setting it up in the first place? And that's why in the past, as we're beginning these generous churches, this way out begins a growing and nurturing disciples. So that our people are more Christ-like, they grow in influence, they grow in numbers, they grow in generosity of giving, but also they are the kind of church like our 21-year-old who one day want to join. So I am not into bureaucracy for the sake of it, but um, I don't want to be like people who say science is bad, and then they complain when electricity fails. <laughs> Would your grace like to expand on the Daily Telegraph article last Monday, which said that the success of your initiative in the real Easter egg trade was so good that some of the top supermarkets are now producing eggs with the cross of Christ. The thing was this, I was contacted um, by, by a company in Manchester, and this is a good thing about it, in Manchester, who are concerned, a statistic had come out that most of all our children didn't know the Easter story. And yet, at Easter, the average intake of chocolate was about four kilos per child. <laughs> Huge amount of chocolate. But they didn't know why they were having Easter eggs. So, in Manchester, they thought, why don't we produce the real Easter egg? So we had a conversation, how we're going to produce it, what's going to be the price, and, and they produced three kinds, and they sent them down and I tested them, and I said, no, I don't like the test of that, I don't like the test of that, the test is appalling, the quality has got to be much improved. So the factory in Nottingham improved the quality of the chocolate. And then they were just typical church. They thought they were marketed at a very low nobody's going to buy it right now. Well, for three pounds, 99 pence, people may actually buy it. And, and anyway, we tested a number of chocolates, and then at one our college of bishops, we all had a, a, this tester, <laughs> blind tester, of chocolate everybody loved. Uh, and I'm proud to say that the choice that I made, most bishops thought, was the best. <laughs> so we went into production. And I wrote out a message about this real Easter egg. And, and I wrote, we went to supermarkets, let's go from there, we're not going to have it. Um, because it's Christian, it's to divide it, it's to this. And, and we tried Waitrose, not so sure, Sainsbury, no, Morrison's, no. Um, well, what are we going to do? So I said the best thing is start, regardless of the market. We are going to email it out to people and say, this is the view of Easter egg. It looks like this. We put an advert in the chat papers and then um, sent to every church, every school. And, and I said, the only way you're going to make sure that you do not make a loss is limited to 50,000 eggs. Because that's likely to, to be sold. And friends, within three weeks, all those 50,000 eggs have been ordered. So we said we produce another 50,000. So 100,000 was the first taken. Uh, and God, by his share good grace, I was invited to open Waitrose in New York. The first thing I said to the manager, you are never knowingly understood, are you? <laughs> he said, no, I want to offer you a real history where you will never be knowingly understood because the price 
would be the cell fixed. Three pounds ninety nine. So he took a rambo, and then first he said, uh, they took some, and the thing shot in the time, they were gone. Uh, and then a lot of people last year went to Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's, I mean the corporate really journey, demanding this real Easter egg, this real, and the demand was so great. Uh, and when people were picking it up, thinking it is, it isn't, and they put it back, and the cell became less of all the other eggs, they decided this time they're going to go, and already people have ordered huge amounts online. And this business is not. I believe two things about it here is that the quality of that egg is very good. That's the first thing. <laughs> Secondly, it's fair trade chocolate. Uh, and then thirdly, the profit which is made doesn't go to the wholesome chocolate factory or company that makes it, it actually goes to help. And they've set up about now six, seven schools up in, in the Ivory Coast where the chocolate comes from. So it goes back to help farmers and everything else. And you know, in this country, people, people still have got a sense of feeling responsible for the world. Really. And, and because the profits which are made, should go back to help farmers, uh, not the people who are producing. It's been, it's been, I mean, it's, it's been one of those amazing, amazing things. I remember when I backed it, people thought, I wish for yours, the patron saint of lost causes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that has come about. Gracious Father. We just thank you for your love for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We just thank you that in moments of perplexity, lack of understanding and wisdom, you love us for who we are, not our abilities, our knowledge, but that you created us in your image and likeness, and that you wonderfully restored us in your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that in our witness, in our work, in our leisure, Christ will be honored in our bodies. So light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and vengeance of this night. For the love of our only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all this night and forever. Amen.